And you guys are live now. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Today it's March 9th, 2021. This is uh, the North Miami Community Redevelopment Agency's meeting. And uh, we start exactly at 101 p.m. And I welcome everyone. Since we have uh, a quorum of three council members on site at City Hall, I think uh, we are ready to conduct business. Madam City Clerk, Madam Secretary, can you call the meeting to order, please? Yes, Chairman Pierre. Here. Board Member Keys. Here. Board Member Deselme. Board Member Galvin. Here. For the record, Board Member Galvin is appearing by audio only. Board Member Estime Irvin. Present. Chairman, you have a quorum to proceed based on what the attorney has informed us. Board Member Galvin is in the building. And so therefore with you and uh, Councilman Keyes or Board Member Keyes, we have a quorum. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. Can we rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. And now we have the consent agenda on present tab A and B, Madam Secretary. Unless a member of the CRA board wishes to remove a specific item from this portion of the agenda, tabs A through B constitute the consent agenda. These resolutions and items are self-explanatory and are not expected to require additional review or discussion. These items will be recorded as individually numbered resolutions adopted unanimously by the following motion. But the consent agenda comprised of tabs A through B be adopted. I'm sorry, Madam Secretary, it's A through C. I apologize. There are three oh, items. It was a last minute item entered. So they've sent, I've, I've received at least three different <laughs> revisions. So let me here. Yeah, ta right. tab C so is the advisory C. committee appointment. Right, tabs A through C. Thank you very much. The concert agenda is tab A to C. Mm -hmm. Can I have a motion on the concert? So moved. Second. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a motion made by Board Member Galvin to approve the consent agenda. The motion was seconded by Board Member Keyes. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries with a 4 0 vote. Thank you very much. Let's move to item. And now we are agenda item number one. All right, give me one second. Right. Agenda item one, resolution to approve COVID-19 emergency residence assistance. A can resolution. We have, oh, sorry, can we have a, a discussion for both item one and item two, since it's one presentation and then we will vote on both together. If there's any amendment, we can do it. Steve, can we do that? There are separate resolutions. If you'd like to read the both resolutions into the record, um, I would appreciate that we took separate votes on each item. Okay, okay. Madam Secretary, you can go. 
Okay, so Chairman Vietnam, is what you're asking me to do to read both resolutions now, but knowing that we have to take two separate votes? Yeah, we will have the discussion on both, and then we will take two separate votes, one after one. Okay, and that's okay, Steve? If you read both um, resolutions into the record at this time, uh, they'll have a discussion, and then they'll do separate votes. I think that's fine. Okay. So agenda item one, resolution to approve COVID-19 emergency residence assistance. A resolution of the chairman and board members of the North Miami Community Redevelopment Agency establishing the COVID-19 emergency resident assistance program. Allocating $500,000 to the COVID-19 emergency resident assistance program, authorizing the executive director to take all steps necessary and appropriate to implement the COVID-19 emergency resident assistance program and providing an effective date. Agenda item two, resolution to approve COVID-19 business grant, a resolution of the chairman and board members of the North Miami Community Redevelopment Agency allocating an additional $500,000 to the emergency relief to reopen business grant program, authorizing the executive director to take all steps necessary and appropriate to implement the additional allocation to the emergency relief to reopen business grant program and providing an effective date. Thank you very much. Agenda item number one and number two, presentation by the executive director. Good afternoon, chairman and board members. Good afternoon, Councilman Galvin uh, and Councilman Dizumi. <laughs> I was waiting on you. Um, before you are two uh, COVID relief grant programs that the CRA is asking for your consideration. The first one is the Emergency Residence Assistance Program. We're asking to be allocated $500,000. This program will offer up to $4,000 to eligible residents who have received evictions, foreclosure, utility notices, um, a condo association notices, any other arrears notices that would put their residency in jeopardy. Um, they would be eligible for it. All applicable requirements are outlined in the attached grant guidelines. Um, this program, as um, I had mentioned before, the board had approved for us to hire both chambers of commerces to be the administrator of this. They have already been trained um, in the program and they are ready to administer the program once the board approves it. So that one is for the residence assistance program. Um, for the business assistance program, the, the staff is requesting an allocation of $500,000 for this program. This is 7500 dollars to small businesses still in need of assistance have applied or attempted to apply for the second PPP funds have applied for other resources to no avail these funds are for operational expenses again as long as they show that they are in arrears with their rent and their utilities they would be able to be qualified businesses who had received the five thousand um, dollar jumpstart COVID cares funds in December would be eligible for only twenty five hundred dollars because in December they had received $5,000 to be fair. Um, again, all applicable requirements are outlined in the attached guidelines. They are similar to what we had done before, the previous Jumpstart grants. Um, again, the, this grant will be administered by the Greater North Miami Chamber of Commerce and the Haitian American Chamber of Commerce, and they've both been trained in processing these grant applications. If you have any questions, I am available. Thank you very much. Let's open it to the public. Public hearing is open on item number one and number two. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending this afternoon's virtual CRA meeting. This meeting will allow live public comment by attendees. Public hearing will take place upon announcement by the chair of the meeting, Chairman Philip Bienemé, and from that time, attendees will be able to virtually raise their hands and this should function similarly to lining up at the podium. If you're participating by phone, please press star nine now if you would like to raise your hand. When it is your turn to speak, a pin will be sent to you. Enter that pin to unmute yourself when you hear your name called. Attendees cannot leave their hands raised throughout the entire meeting. So if you raise your hand before an item is read, it will be removed. Do not forget to state your full name and complete address for the record. And remember that you will have up to two minutes to make your comment. Thank you in advance for your understanding and your feedback. IT, you'll have to let me know if any hands are raised. I see none. 
Thank you very much. No previews. There were no previously submitted comments for this agenda item. Thank you very much. Now, item one and two are closed. Discussion, and now let's go on the board. Board members? Any questions? Board member Desume. Yes, Councilman Desume. Board member Keys, you want to go first? Go ahead. Oh, I'll call, I'll it, was just, it was just a comment. I don't think it was mentioned that both of these will be also administered uh, by the Greater North Miami Chamber of Commerce and the Haitian Chamber of Commerce. So people know that it's just a continuation and that you've yeah. trained them because we had that discussion, Rasha. Yes, ma'am. I did, I did mention that. And as soon as the board approves it, our PR firm is going to release um, the press release and it has all the information, where to go, the email addresses, website, and phone number for both chambers. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Uh, Chairman, um, yes. may I go? Okay. I wanted to, the only comment I want to make, I, I am in support of the item, of both items. Um, the only comment I, I do want to make, and I, and I spoke to Rasha about this, was I am glad that the, the home, the residential assistant program is open to homeowners because in the past, my folks in my district, because we, we don't have a, um, many uh, apartments, we our numbers usually be low. So in a case like that, where we, we want to be fair, um, in in the future, if we have some, some is it somebody's um, background? If we would have somewhat of an allocation where it would be very evenly or at least where they would feel like they'll get a fair share because what I've been hearing was like there has never been anything for them to help the homeowners on the west side of the city. Um, but this does open it for for, um, for them now. Um, but that that's just my comment. And I mentioned it to Rasha in terms of the emergency residential assistant is how we could leverage it where it's it's a, a fair playing field for those who did not apply before. Another question we have to understand, those are people affected by COVID-19. That's been for people who've been living on a fixed income, who've been working throughout the pandemic, or they would qualify, Adam Kamu. Now these are people who were affected by COVID-19 and can show uh, a demonstrable hardship that they were not able to pay their rent, mortgage, and, and other fees. So they have to show that they suffered because of COVID-19. If someone been living on a fixed income, for example, and they cannot pay the mortgage, the BI on the mortgage, will they qualify? Again, no, because they would have to show that they were affected by COVID-19. Okay, so. that's we got to make it clear. That means it's not just because you be high on your mortgage, you need yeah. to be affected by COVID 19 one way or the other. That yes, means if someone live on a fixed income, but then they've been taking care of a family member who've been affected by COVID 19, will they be able to qualify? Well, they would have to show that you know, they were, you know, they had medical expenses that otherwise, that, that's a little bit more complicated of a, of a you know, question, but yeah, they, if they that's show it. that- I'm gonna give you an example. Take care of someone. I'm over 60, my wife been working, right? Yes. yes. And I wasn't working, but she been yes. in the hospital yes. for two yes. months, for three months due to COVID-19. And they can show that. Yes. They will be eligible. Yes, sir. As long as you can show on paper the hardship and that it was related to COVID-19. Um, most of the people we've helped are, yes, they are on fixed income, but there's somebody in the household that was bringing that additional dollar. That person was unemployed or was not able to get back to work at 100%. So that, that household suffered still because they're not bringing the same amount of money they were bringing before COVID-19. So if you can, if, if, if you can put together a note, how can you be affected by COVID and you put different scenario, question mm -hmm. answers, 
I okay. think that would help them. Okay. 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 Thank you very much, Councilwoman Estime Irvin. Um, thank you. I just want to clear for the public that's listening, um, um, Ms. Kamo. Um, if someone had received relief prior, are they still eligible to receive it now? December. Uh, if they had received part of the, when we were helping the city through their CARES Act funds, there were 19 small businesses that we helped at $5,000. That was in December. So if they're applying again and they're in compliance, they had already provided us with the you know receipts for that $5,000, they would be eligible for $2,500. Only yes. those, because the I, previous, I, the previous grantees. I'm huh? talking about the rent relief and the mortgage relief. Oh, I'm That's sorry. I'm sorry. I yeah. apologize. That's uh, we mix them both together. Um, well, again, they have to show that they're in hardship. So we've already had a resident that came here. She got a letter. She they say she owes ten thousand dollars in rent, which we can't help. But this is for people who are in hardship and are in jeopardy of being evicted or foreclosed upon. So my so, question: yes. If someone had a hardship mm -hmm. and was helped prior. And then um, I guess um, that you you know we helped them out already, and then mm -hmm. now they're still in a, in a hardship. Are they eligible to receive those funds? Yes, ma'am. Because what we okay. the, the renters program was you know up, up at least six months ago, so okay. they would have to show that they they were still unemployed. They're still not able to make their rent. That they're showing that they're collecting unemployment. They provide us with the qualifying documentation to show that they're eligible, and we verify with the landlord that you know, some of them actually have been make, making payments, but they're just not there completely because they didn't receive, they're not getting a full paycheck or they're still not you know, getting a job. And, and just so for, again, for the benefit of the public, these funds are only available for people that live in, within the CRA boundaries. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another question, Madam, uh, 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 executive director the four thousand dollar maximum for the rental I have to be able to take them out of eviction yes sir the landlord has to acknowledge that there if they had foreclosure for um eviction proceedings started they will have to acknowledge that they've stopped it and they're going to stop it for another 30 days no we got the ex we have to extend it because you don't want to give a landlord four thousand dollars and after 30 days, let's see someone or someone is paying $1,000 a month. Mm -hmm. They owe 10 months. Even though if they receive the 4000 next month, they're gonna, that person going to receive another eviction letter. My professional opinion would be if you owe $10,000 and we won't be able to help you, you should look at another location to relocate to. Okay, what we're going to be able to do, they can be able use to that 4000 for relocation. Madam Executive yes. Director, they can use that four thousand dollars for relocation within the CRA boundary. Yes, sir. They can use oh. it for first, last, and security deposit. Up to four thousand dollars. Up to four thousand dollars. Yes. Okay. That's the part we want because within we don't the want CRA. someone who has fifteen thousand dollars. The landlord gonna be happy to take your four thousand dollars after thirty days. They're gonna send under the eviction letter. It's better to use that four thousand to relocate it within yes, the CRA boundary. Yes, and the chamber um, staff have been trained for that. And Gail McDonald and myself are the final approvers. We do we use our discretion to determine if it's feasible that they're not gonna get evicted, or if we should recommend they move to a location within the CRA. Your your CRA guideline doesn't have any help for multifamily units, no. Rental, oh, no. that would be eviction. That would just be the rental assistance. It's still no, no, part no. of it, but not no, no, for no. the landlord, for like the whole, all the apartments, no. Okay, that's when if we can reach out to some landlord who have empty spaces, that's when it's better to relocate those people so they can start their new life. Yes, Councilwoman. Thank you. Um, um, uh, Rasha, um, I'd like to ask this question. Uh, we had a lot of issues where, um, well, not a lot, but a couple of issues where um, 
the tenants wanted to get the help, but then the landlord either didn't understand and want to participate. Is there a process? Do we have a, a, a alternative process? Yeah, um, that happened twice. Um, that happened twice. What we did is uh, we ended up having the, the check. We had the check cut to the tenant, but the landlord had to come and pick it up here and sign for it. So they both went to the bank, cashed the check, brought me a receipt. What in a case where the tenant does not, I mean, the landlord does not want to participate. Is there something? Um, yes, that's if, what we did. We paid the, we, we cut the, we did the check to the tenant. The landlord and the tenant came in person to pick up the check, sign for it, and then they went to the bank, cashed it, and the landlord provided us with a receipt. They didn't, the landlord doesn't want to have their information in our system, okay. but so they, so, so they will take the payment. Yeah, that's how we resolved it. Yeah, so the chambers are trained to deal with that situation, or you will be dealing yes. with that situation yourself. Yes, yeah, again, the chambers don't admit also, the cash. Yes, sir. No, what I was saying, in the event that the landlord doesn't want to cooperate, doesn't want to do all that, even come and pick up the check, that means there's nothing that we can do in that situation. Yes. Yes, but I mean, so far, like I said, all the landlords, they showed up and, um, you know, they were there, they signed the paperwork, the we have it for audit purposes. So yes, so yeah. far everything from the past experience worked smoothly and we train the chamber staff to pay attention to pitfalls, to, you know, duplication of requests and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, Gail McDonald and myself, CRA staff, we're the final um, stop. We get the package, we review it, we make sure that there are no duplications, that the actual hardship is valid before we enter it into the system um, so we can uh, process the payment. Any questions okay. from the Dias? Madam Secretary, I know you've been dealing with a lot of eviction and things like that. Do you have any questions? Because I know you've been helping some people. I don't know if there's any case that uh, you can brought to us in question. Yeah, so a few times what people have been reporting is that the landlord will take the payment for past due rent, but then start to make claims that there's damaged property, that different things uh, they're charging now for different things. And so they'll take whatever amount of money was given. So let's say $2,000, they'll take that and they'll apply it to essentially what a security deposit would be used for. And then now say, well, you're still back and we're still sending eviction notices. So now what we're having to do is work with our residents to connect them to pro bono attorneys that we're finding throughout the community and trying to train up to understand how to do it. Um, and so that's the issue that we're really seeing right now. For and I'm not sure like if there's this. a mechanism for these agreements to be a little bit stronger, these, you know, promise to not evict, um, agreements to be a little bit stronger i'm not sure you know how how far we can go in that madam executive director it's uh... so we we have a letter from our CRA attorney that for the for the landlord to sign to say one they are not going to continue the eviction proceedings and the late fees and all that stuff and also we'll give them an additional 30 days now if you're talking about damages to the property and all all you know all that stuff that's a little bit different from but what we can, we, we've experienced but we can add that to our language the yes, letter yes. from the attorney so that money should not be applied to you know damage or and anything like that only well the letter the says rent. you should not be charging us late fees so we'll say you should not be charging late fees and damages exactly yeah language yeah yeah will help be by accepting this payment you are acknowledging that you will no longer be um, doing eviction procedures, late fees, and I will add the word damages, the letter that the attorney, um, I had him prepare for them to sign. Thank you very much. If there is no question, can I get a motion, first of all, to, to approve item number one? I move. Second. Madam Secretary. 
I have a motion made by board member Esther May Irvin to approve agenda item one. The motion was seconded by board member Galvin. Also for the record, board member Alex Desilme is present. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries with a 5 0 vote. No, and uh, if there's no two. question, can I? Can I have your motion on item number two? So moved. Um, second. I have a motion made by board member Estime Irvin to approve agenda item two. The motion was seconded by board member Galvin. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries with a 5 0 vote. Thank you very much. Item number three. Agenda yes. item three, Griffin Community Center Design Presentation. Thank you very much. Um, um, I'd like to introduce you, reintroduce you to Meryl Romanic, the architect that we had hired as a response to an um, RFP we had put out to help with the redesign of the Griffin Community Center area. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, we had to pause um, for almost a year now. Um, but we had started the process, had done several community workshops and had done several briefings um, to determine what kind of programming we wanted to see and, and so on, so we can start the steps. These are the foundations to building, um, to designing a proper community center um, for that uh, for Griffin Estates or Griffin Park. Um, we did do a final virtual workshop with the community and we got several inputs. Um, we also presented at the CRA Advisory Committee last Monday and also Ms. Romanic presented to the Parks Advisory Board last Thursday evening as well, um, yes. the, the presentation that you will see. So now I will mute myself and pass on to Meryl Romanic. Clyde, could you put up the PowerPoint, please? There we go. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, present kind of the results of the process and where we are today with regard to um, Griffin Park and uh, sort of forging forward with a direction um, as far as layout. Um, so I'm going to thumb through these quickly because you all have seen uh, some of this before. This is the aerial for the existing park. Next slide, Claude. Kind of some of the unique things that are on the site. Uh, we have a public art piece, which is the tree of uh, the tree of hope. That's there. Um, we've got the Mem veterans memorial, the clock tower. We obviously have the water frontage that's part of our site, and then the existing gripping center. Next slide, Claude. These are just bubble diagrams of of what's on site. We know that we've got the JC Hall at the bottom of the triangle, if you will. We've got parking and we've got a boat ramp. We've also got two sets of shuffleboard courts, the Griffing Park Community Center in between that, another parking at the end. We've got a little garden of hope that was installed. On the triangle piece of the site is the, in green is the tree. Um, we've got the veterans uh, fountain, we've got the clock tower, and then we've got a small restroom and, and uh, covered pavilion, and then kind of just a free flowing open park. Next slide, please. We polled everybody to find out and worked with the staff to find out what the current active, active adult programs are and they're offering today Pilates, body sculpting, and yoga. Next slide. And also crocheting, painting, quilting, and um, jewelry making is part of their existing programs. Um, what's kind of unique to Griffin is that because it really is one room, um, the adult programs are kind of isolated to the mornings and then the children join in the afternoon. So from a programming standpoint, it's either one or the other. It's been difficult to have uh, them overlap on top of one another. The current youth programs, or not current, pre-COVID, um, are after school care, tutoring, and lunch snack programs for the youth. Next slide. Um, we'd like to enhance that and things that we heard from communal community meetings, park and rec meetings, meetings with you all, and the input that we've received through different um, input is that we'd like to see if this can remain a neighborhood type of park, but could we introduce a youth program for summer camps and not summer camps that are highly maybe athletic and court and field based, but maybe ones that are art based and, uh, and or theater based and then has you know day trips to here or to there, but something more of a neighborhood-based type of summer camp. Next. 
We also talked about maybe adding some STEM and robotics and computer lab space uh, that's dedicated for those types of activities. Those could be used by the youth for continuing their learning through the course of a day, um, connecting and plugging and playing for uh, tutoring and things after school but also adults could use that for different courses related to, you know, taxes, ESOL, want to learn how to use a computer, all those type of things. We could really make it a win-win for, for both entities. Next, please. Uh, we also heard that we want to enhance that fitness. A lot of the fitness that happens today is really roll down a mat, roll it up and put it away type of uh, fitness programs. And, Certainly we can do that, but to have a room that's kind of dedicated to that would be nice to have the right flooring, the right lighting, the right plug and play, the right connectivity, the mirror on the wall, and really have the right space for that type of stuff they already have. But then we heard that it'd be great if we had some sort of true um, fitness room where we had cardio equipment, could run programs, athletic uh, uh, types of uh, programs to really enhance and promote wellness. Next slide. We also heard about the arts and crafts rooms. There is a very strong quilting program there. Um, and arts and craft programs tend to not be as easily flexible, meaning that multi-purpose rooms don't really work because there's a lot of storage that's involved and or sinks that need to be involved for the stuff for the different programs. So the idea was that we would find a way to have a room that's dedicated for arts and crafts. So all the infrastructure is built in to allow it to work not only for the quilting, but for jewelry making, for painting, for crocheting, like there'd be enough storage to allow those types of programs to occur. Next slide. One other thing that we talked about is, you know, if we've heard from you all that you wanna have some sort of banquet hall facility as part of this facility, and that means a catering kitchen. Um, and why couldn't that catering kitchen, because certainly you wanna have an event and be able to serve people food and, and have, you know, the, sh the chefs and the, catering folks set up and, and spread the spread the love of food. But couldn't we also have that be dual purpose and have it be a demonstration kitchen? So then it's programmatically, you know, there could be programs on learning to cook for kids, uh, healthy cooking for adults, cake decorating, you know, different programs, guest chefs, things like that, that we could use that catering kitchen, not just as a place for that intermittent event that would occur, but a place that really is true, truly programmatic. Next, please. The multi-purpose rooms, we've heard, you know, that we want to build in as much flexibility as possible. It could be set up as a banquet, it could be set up as a lecture hall, could be set up as a boardroom, could be set up for trainings, have sliding walls so that you could have two small rooms, three small rooms, one big giant one. So we're going to try to build in as much flexibility as we can. Next slide. We're not going to break down in the details, but in the summation of the program that we developed, and this is pretty much at this point about a, uh, over a year old. Um, we know that we need a welcome center and a place to uh, welcome folks to the center, a reception desk, office spaces, restrooms, concession area, um, janitor's closets. That, so that's the, that core that's in red. Active adult, we think we need about 4,000 square feet. For the youth areas, about 6,000 square feet. For the gym and the fitness areas, that would be about just over 3,000 square feet. And the multi-purpose space, that's the one for the true banqueting area, which we had heard that we wanted to be able to seat uh, at tables and chairs 200 people. Um, and then the JC and Knights Hall, after doing their programming study, we need about 2,300 square feet to accommodate their needs. All in total, we're hovering around 30,000 square feet of space. Um, that's part of the program that we developed and then we're using as a, as a guiding tool as we start to look at the site. Our next step, once we just figured out kind of the pieces and the parts, was to start to look at the site. So next slide, Claude. Um, things that we heard from the staff is let's really embrace, or not from staff, from everybody, let's embrace the water's edge and let's create walking trails. Things that connect the entire site and you can do a loop and we can really engage on the water's edge. The water's edge today is difficult to see. There's a few moments that you can spot it. We got to clean that out. And we know that via the tree survey that there's a lot of evasive material that needs to come out anyway. Next. Waterway activities. Why don't we engage it? Paddle boarding, kayaking, fishing, eco programs, cleanups, all that kind of good stuff can occur off of that water's edge. Next. 
multi-age playground. Again, this would enhance the youth programs, have a place for folks and kids to play and climb and, and engage, as well as having multi-age, also ADA compliance for that playground. It'd support the summer camp program in, in addition and just be that soft little neighborhood spot where folks can go. Next. Outdoor fitness is also something to consider. Um, having equipment that you can actually create kind of a CrossFit kind of experience in the park as part of maybe that walking trail. We're, we'll take a look at that next. Small performance in amp movie amphitheater. We know to, not today, but in the past, pre-COVID, was that the park was used for movie nights, uh, used for gathering types of events, little arts and crafts types things. So creating a true little pavilion, if you will, that would allow it to be maybe a you could actually hold a picnic under there by day, but during uh, an event, you could use it as a place to perform, to sing, to um, have music, so it, and or hang a screen so that you could have those, you know, gatherings of events for, for multiple people and viewing a similar focal point. Next. Picnic area is an open park. Um, what we heard too is people like how kind of casual Griffin Park is, that it's not too, too structured. Um, that it's got just little places to picnic and little pickup places to, to just kick the ball around and very soft. Next. The one concept we introduced to everyone is kind of how to marry the two sides of the street. You know, we at Griffin Park, we're unique in that Griffin Boulevard kind of bisects our site um, and, and it becomes a little bit of a thoroughfare and a little bit of a cut through. So how do we soften that experience along the roadscape? There's a concept out of uh, the Netherlands called a Woonerf, which takes a look at the streets and really modifies what we all know is that traditional curb gutter street. And you're told pedestrians here, cars there, and you're gonna go fast and we're gonna go slow. And it's very separating as far as experience. And what they do is by changing textures, by changing site furnishing, the landscaping, keeping it all on a level playing field, it becomes a much softer experience where the driver knows I better slow down visually. It doesn't look like a normal street. The pedestrian feels more comfortable crisscrossing that experience. So it's something that we want to integrate in at, at some points to make sure that we can marry the two sides of the site. Next, please. So in big picture, um, A is always going to be labeled the the uh, community center building. We have always in all of these schemes look at it as though it's a two-story structure. Um, it's a big footprint, 30,000 square feet. So we don't want to take up too much of the green space um, and not have that building, you know, go vertical and allow that to happen. We also think programmatically that, you know, there's certain things that are going to happen by day and or daily operations, if you will. And then there's the things that will happen by event, right? Things that are scheduled, booked um, and taken care of. So in as a loose bubble diagram, we're looking at that the first floor becomes that day-to-day, -day, the second floor becomes that more event-based type of, of activities. Um, so this scheme takes the building and puts it at the corner um, <clears throat> and basically um, kind of faces the water's edge, becomes kind of a focal point at the entry, if you will, to the city off of Dixie, um, puts some parking along that edge. What you see in the dash line is a trail that wraps the entire perimeter and that's kind of circulation. What you see uh, in T is at the top left is where we would place the JC's hall. We like the idea of the fact that the JC hall, its square footage is about 2,300 square foot feet, which is kind of the equivalent to a house, right? So it's not going to be this big tall structure next to a residential, not really disrupt their world. Their parking will face to the opposite side, away from the neighborhood, and kind of give us a nice softer transition. It allows them to have their own identity allow still gives them a, a water frontage that they have today and kind of creates that transition from park to neighborhood. We put the boat ramp in every scenario at that same location right in front of the JC so people can come in, in and out, drop off, you know, go do their thing and kind of come in and out without disrupting. If you had a larger event at the facility and really needed to make sure that traffic flowed properly around the building. D is the cat that wound earth, that connection between the streets from this from one side of the site to the other side of the site, even up on 123rd, kind of finding ways to really slow that traffic down and kind of marry the site with the neighborhood. Uh, P is the playground, P, and that would wrap around that electrified tree um, art installation piece. 
Um, and then R is really picnic areas and E is the uh, amphitheater. And what we'd like to do is, what's interesting and we learned in the site is that there is a right of way that connects D2 to D2 and that exists um, and originally was planned for to be a street. So why not embrace it, but make it a soft street, uh, you know, a boulevard, if you will, of landscape um, that connects the neighborhood to the park and kind of make it, it's a, a thoroughfare, if you will, again, but more a softer and friendlier version. In all, every single scheme, the clock tower and the fountain remain where they are. We know that they've, it's, some of that stuff's been moved once. We don't want to have to move it twice if we don't have to. And we feel like, you know, it has a presence and a memory on the site and we're trying to keep it as sacred as we can. So this is option A. What uh, Roshan mentioned, and Claude, you can switch to the next slide, is that after we had the community meeting in early December, we posted it up on SurveyMonkey and got feedback from folks. So this is just some of the feedback that we received from different folks um, as they responded to the survey. We asked them, shared each, each options. They were able to give feedback on each option because we have three options that we shared. And then at the end, vote for which one would be their, their preference. So the next slide shares more of the feedback that we received on option A. Um, and uh, you can see that some people like it because it fronts the water. Some people don't like it because it's on the water. And you're going to see a little, you know, a little bit of feedback from everybody. The next option is option B, which um, took a little bit of a different twist. But like I said, the, the JC's Hall stayed where it is. The clock tower and the fountain stayed where it is. But we took A as the building and actually said, what if we put the building where that thoroughfare is? Maybe the building itself and whether there's a colonnade on either side starts to do the connection from fourth down towards the park and actually helps keep the traffic flowing. And what we liked about kind of that cradle shape is in this option was is that the amphitheater could be part of that cradle experience and meaning that you could have the stage at the corner of 20, 123rd and Griffin and you could have this grassy area, but the building could be you know, elevated enough that you could look from the ground floor and have some elevation to look at what's going on and maybe from the second level, look down and see what's going on. So it kind of creates this um, uh, amphitheater effect as far as an arena experience. So you would have multi-tiered ways to view. Um, it still allows for that wound earth connection between fourth and then the, you know, the water side of the property. We would move the picnicking and the playground and areas over to this water side um, obviously, with the playground, we need to create, uh, you know, the proper height enclosure as far as a fence that, so that folks, little ones couldn't wander out there, but create great buffers. You can also do some of that. We'd always create the fence, but we could berm around it, right, to protect us from Dixie Highway, soft landscaping, and really kind of create this organic experience at that corner so that it, we provide that, if you will, buffer um, that allows for them to, to play safely um, and freely continue that walkway system so that now the public really gets to see whether they come to park and drop off their boat or come to go picnic along the water's edge or come and bring their little ones to the playground. We really get to experience that water's edge um, as its own little entity and, and not have the building part of that experience. And even with the cradling of the building, that allows you to even see, you'll see the water's waves just because of the softness of the shape from upstairs. So when the banquet hall, you'll be able to experience that. So this is option um, B. Sec next slide, Claude. Same same feedback, we, I mean, it's not same feedback, different feedback we received from different people. Uh, again, I'm not gonna read them all and I'm hoping you guys can see them on your screen, but it, um, some people, you know, Plan B allows for green space near the water, which people appreciated that as an idea. And the building doesn't look as, as heavy and massive in that form. Next slide, Claude. So this is just the individual feedbacks we received. I think there's one more slide to this one, yeah. And then option C. Um, basically took the building more in the same format as it was when it was on the water's edge and moved it to the site. You can see that by nature of its form, it seems to envelop a little bit more of the green space and you end up with little pockets of green space where when we curved it, it kind of left the edge along Griffin Boulevard, Boulevard much more soft um, and, and left you a little bit more contiguous open space. Um, it, we've got parking along there and we put the amphitheater kind of where the JC Hall is today, shooting back to the park. 
um, again, the JC Hall and the boat ramp where it was. We've got picnicking next to the building and then push the playground up to 123rd and in the intersection of Dixie Highway. Um, so it just kind of creates a little bit more of the softer elements along Dixie. Um, the water's edge gets a little bit more of the parking. Um, and, and this was another way to, to solve the puzzle and the feedback we received on the next slides. Um, in, in general terms, this was the one that folks like the least in far as far as their general feedback, um, just because it felt, I think, with the building so engaged in the center, it left a lot of little parts around it. Um, so they just kind of weren't as open to this as, as the others. Next slide. And you can go to the next slide. So at the end of the day, like I said, we, we let them, I'm sorry, it's askew. I don't know why it's not lined up on the side. We asked them to vote on which ones you prefer. And by basically two thirds uh, vote, option B was the preferred approach to start to head in a direction. Um, and that is the results that we've got today. And the next slide just shows you option B. Um, and we're here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. And um, question from the dais. Yes, Councilman Gagman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Romanic, I noticed the percentages that you showed, 66%, 33%. How many people does that represent? There were 16 people responded. One, six? 16, yes. Okay. That, I, I'm just throwing that out there because to me that's a very small percentage on which to base the building of this brand new facility. We probably need to shop it a little bit more, uh, get some more feedback. Was that pretty much the Parks Commission that you heard from? You know, with the Survey Monkey, I don't know. I'm not necessarily told who's responded, but you know, I know that um, we had it open from. I want to say the December 4th or 5th, all the way through yeah. the end of the month. Fair enough. I just think 16 people is really, really a small sample size. Um, let whatever, whichever one of these options get chosen, when do you, when is construction happening? When do you knock down? When do you complete? What's the, what's the parameter for that? Okay. Well, where we are, where we, you know, unfortunately, we took a little bit of a break, right, with the with with the COVID breaks, breaks over. <laughs> I know, party's on. So, but what we've done now is we, once we kind of build consensus and say this is the approach, because I think we all acknowledge that you know, there were different ways to look at this, and I we couldn't look at it and say we're going to go do this one, and we're going to do this one, and we're going to do this one. We kind of need to build consensus as far as you know direction, as far as positioning, because it's certainly is a unique site, right? Having this divider that goes between this, this the- This is a long answer for a short question. A short question, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, unless um, you're gonna stick around with us for the next council meeting for the whole thing. No, no, I'm not. Have, okay. have mercy on us for those that have several hours ahead of us. Okay, so in, the short answer is, is that at this point we, with this direction, we can begin doing schematics of the floor plans and the elevations. That process um, should take us a, you know, a couple months to get something to build consensus. And then from there, we can start construction drawings. I think all told, the design, completion of the design is probably six to eight months before that will be complete. And then you can bid it and send it out to construction. So I'm thinking by the end of this year, we would go out to construction and start construction early next year. And, and then it's probably a 12 month construction period. So my last question is about the J.C. Hall, and my understanding is that the Knights are moving, so we probably should get away from the lexicon of J.C. Knights Hall. Mm -hmm. um, the the J.C.s, yeah, <laughs> the J.C.s own that building, though the city owns the land and leases it to them. Has anybody from the C.R.A.s end had a discussion with them about how we would handle? that scenario, would they own the new building? Would we own the new building? Would uh, they sell us their existing building? Like, I think a little complicated. How are we handling that? Um, we haven't had that conversation yet with, uh, with the gentleman, actually. Last time I spoke with him was around November. Um, but he's aware of it. I think what we needed from you was 
the some direction based on what it is that we have so far, and then the CRA attorney and I will discuss it with them to help us guide us. Is it is it something that you you the board is interested in acquiring paying them for their property and we move on, or are we continuing the partnership that you've had with them over these years? So I you know as soon as I understand more from you your sense then we will proceed that way. Okay. I, I, sorry, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead. Yeah, I could go on and on. I'll leave it at that. But Rasha, uh, let's talk afterwards, please, because okay. that, those conversations need to be had really seriously yeah. mm -hmm. right now. And to Ms. Romanic, we've got to get a bigger sample size than 16 people. To, to Mr. Chairman, if, real quick, to, to Scott's question, I think Scott kind of stole both of my questions. My first question to Ms. Romanic was the 2,300 square foot for the, the JC slash night. Is it a two-story building? That's the first question. No, um, that is a one story. One story. One story, not good. The other question would be, um, well, I think Scott kind of threw it out there. The preference, well, my preference would be if we would um, buy, you know, whatever that we would buy it and then get into the agreement with them again where you know it's us but we're leasing it whatever the nine nine year with the dollar a year thing that would be much more comfortable where we don't you know where it's very clean and whatever whatever the cases and i would prefer it's a two-story building versus a one because it, you know it's just you know you have all of these things right now going on okay thank you thank you very much councilwoman Evan. Go ahead, you Carol Keys, um, uh, Councilwoman Keys, you can go ahead first. You're on mute. You're muted. Thank you. Sorry. Um, definitely agree with Councilman Galvin, 16 people. I mean, that survey, you don't even know who they are, so I wouldn't give any credence to that whatsoever. Um, I have no idea who these people are. and. Um, whether they're even residents but um i'm very happy well i've always wanted to see that our community building go on the water we have waterfront property we have beautiful waterfront especially when we clean it up um to put any parking on that um over on the water is just absolutely crazy uh, why would you have parking taking up the waterfront you've got a beautiful little walking trail that can be um mingled with our park our picnic area our um our playground and i think that a better place for that parking because parking on all three options are on our waterfront uh you've got this corner on the northeast corner where at one you have a playground which is near apartment buildings you've got mechanic shops you've got noise why would you put anything on that corner other than parking and the other the area next on dixie is not such a beautiful place it is highway and that could be a little bit of parking or you could put the playground so basically i would like to see our community center probably move where the parking lot is and put the picnicking and playground closer to the highway get you're going to be walking a beautiful nature trail, and then you're going to look into a garage. I mean, that, that it makes no sense. And I had always envisioned our community center with a second floor with an open deck, like we have at mm -hmm. FIU, where you have your little, we have our entertainment area. You have actually have an outdoor deck where you can go sit out and enjoy you the know, water. I was so like Mazna Park. You know? I haven't been there. So we have Meisner to take Park, advantage. Uh, in Halea. Okay. Nice We've got to take advantage of our waterfront for viewing. Even even if the gym portion where people are doing their cardio, they can be looking out the window enjoying the water. Let's not waste it on parking spaces, please. I won't be here, but um, please let's use it for the people, not for some empty cars. And otherwise, it's nice. And the building and the ideas inside the building are great. Love the uh, kitchen uh, station uh, training. Uh, doing things, doing classes there. I think that's really a fabulous thing. So building's good, but get the parking. Even if you have little two parking lots, 
put one parking lot right there in the corner of Dixie and then have your and the amphitheater by the way is in an excellent perfect spot like that thank you thank you very much the only thing I, I want to add uh, councilwoman uh, keys 16 people respond and we have to give credit to those 16 people we would like to see more people get involved and uh, participate in the survey we don't have to know who those 16 people are but uh, 16 people respond we want to give them credit we want to thank them for participating thank them. what we need we need to extend it to more people so we can get mm -hmm. more feedback on having a beautiful center for the community councilwoman thank, thank you yes thank you so much um um so i take the point and then i and i in all fairness i didn't realize it was only 16 people that um responded um, I know that we'd advertise, we had a virtual town meeting to encourage, but I do agree that 16 people is not a good sample size to make a great decision that way. So I have a couple of questions. Um, how, so if we decided to vote on this, could we still vote on this and then with the agreeance of making sure that we have another workshop where we make more effort, maybe something in a social distancing format to have more participation? Or do we just have to wait, 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 wait a minute? Is it the presentation or we have it's a to presentation? Vote? It's a presentation it's where we to get feedback from you and more direction. Yeah. Uh -huh. The only thing we can add, we can say we can move forward with having more discussion, more surveys, yeah. and uh to making sure we move forward, but we're not gonna vote on I, I one plan today. Thank you. I was thinking about <laughs> moving forward but yes so yeah i i'm definitely um i'm in agreement of, of you know definitely getting more participation um do we even have the finances to start even if we had to design now so no, I, the cra's portion as as we discussed the cra's obligation was to work on the design scope of it and afterwards we're, we're talking about the the funding capacity and we we discuss options which would be we would need to if we, the CRA is taking this on would be amending the plan um, as we need to do anyway because it's it's due with the county and so on and also looking at other opportunities for funding um, for the state and possibly the city eventually so you're muted for some reason I'm not muted okay okay <laughs> yes Okay, so again, I, I, I'm in agreement with my colleagues that we need a little bit more um, participation. Okay. Please, thank you, but I like the direction that it's going in. Thank you. Thank you so much. We got enough um, direction from, from the board and I know what we're gonna do next. And I will email you all our next steps so everybody's aware. We'll redo another virtual meeting, try to extend the, do another survey month. Not virtual, people, people meet more. together, people go to, the to yeah. Can I make a, 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 a yes, people to get the vaccine so we can move forward? Can I make a, a um a suggestion, Rasha? Sure. Yes. yes, sir. Perhaps having someone to do the social distancing door to door to around that area um to do the survey that could that could I think that probably be your best bet, making sure that you are hitting the residents with the picture okay. or whatever. Um, because those people you may have getting people who, who do not have access to what you are um you know showing or standing in front of public so or whatever that type of outreach um i think that could be beneficial um yeah. you know the person the person something like but that the, the other thing we, we we have to reach out to the people living around but understand that a city project we need to reach out the to the, city, the entire city that's when someone can live all the way east or all the way west Okay. But at the end of the day, the center is going to serve them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Yes. Agreed. Yeah. Um, keys, Councilor make keys. Yeah, I'm, I'm agreeing with you, Mayor, because this is going to belong to the whole city. Uh, there really are, we don't have a facility like that anywhere east. So the central is what we're going to be using. And um, the people who live around there are also quite a few renters that, you know, they may be that's there. True now they're not going to be here uh okay. I mean, mostly those are apartment buildings surrounding there uh so they 
they're not even taxpayers, a lot of them, except through their rent. So, yeah, I think it's the whole city all the way east because I use and have you know, all my meetings here. So it's, yeah. The taxpayers think, understand that the, the, mm -hmm. the ad valor tax of the city is about $28 million, which is the budget of the police department. We have to go get money from those landlords and those commercial in order to balance our budget. That's when they're very important to the city. So that means, so that means you have to um, no, call I don't the understand owners, your point. not the renters. When you say they don't pay tax, the landlords do pay they, taxes. The renters pay their taxes through their rent to the landlords. So talk to the landlords because you're going to be appreciating their value. But they keep the restaurants and the supermarket open by living in the city. Yes, they do. But they're transient, so do they really care what's going to be there? I understand that, but your tax represents 20% of the city budget. Mm -hmm. Your property taxes. That's when mm -hmm. you need to find out the $120 million elsewhere to balance your budget. It's a mixture of both. The homeowners and the renters and the landlord mm -hmm. and the commercial. I'm just saying, don't leave, don't leave out the rest of the city because we're all going to use the it. The entire city, we already say right. it's right. the entire city, whether you renters or homeowners. Thank you very much, and that's conclude our presentation. And uh, Madam Executive Director, do you have any report? Just two brief comments because it's already two o'clock. One, um, the CRA budget was approved at the Board of County Commission last week. I had emailed you and notified you individually. And two, the CRA offices will be moving at the end of this month to the new location, the old JCS yeah. building that you see that they're renovating right now. So um, we will be in transition like the last week of March um, if you're looking for us, but we will make sure that everybody's aware. That's it, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Thank that, you, everyone. Yeah, yeah, Tony, do you have any report? No report, sir. Thank you. Thank you, you very much. Offices. No public comment, Madam Secretary? No public comments. Thank you very much. That was much. previously submitted, and um, Claude will let us know if there are any hands raised. No, Claude? There was one hand raised by Sarah McDevitt, but she put it down. Thank okay. you very much, and that's concluded our CIA meeting for today. Can I your motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. I have a Thank motion made by much. Board Member Nesselme to, to adjourn, seconded by Board Member Galvin. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> the motion carries with a 5-0 vote. We're adjourned. It's at 2.03 p.m. Thank you very much. We're going to yeah. come back in five minutes for our regular conversation.